the topic of this talk is uh, convolutional neural networks. So there's various different types of neural networks, obviously. If you're processing images, which we are, the MNIST images, you always, always, always use a convolutional neural network. You would never, ever do what we just did. So uh, that was the kind of an exercise in what not to do. If you got through the running the Python code, you should have got about 92% accuracy, um, which sounds really good, actually. Most people will be happy with 92% accuracy for most applications, but the MNIST digits is a really simple application, and 92 is a terrible result. So, <laughs> so far, we've looked at fully connected networks. So that one that we just ran was called a fully connected network. And the characteristics of that are that we have a flattened input layer, so that we have this one-dimensional array going in and we have full connectivity. So that means every neuron in the first layer is connected with every neuron in the next layer, and the same all the way through the um, network. So it turns out that these are not really good for image analysis. And there's a few reasons for that. So if you imagine even a relatively small image, 256 by 256 in dimensions, and if it's a color image, it has three channels, red, green, and blue. And to feed it in, you're first going to have to flatten it. And when we flatten it, we lose spatial information, obviously, which is really important if you're trying to interpret the content of the image. And the second thing is, after we've flattened it into this very large 1D array, we have to have connections between every single pixel or every single RGB value into every single uh, neuron in our first hidden layer. So that means that just in this first neuron of the hidden layer, the first weight will have size, uh, weight array will have size 256 by 256 by 3. So it just becomes enormous and it becomes computationally unfeasible, especially if you have larger images. So um, somebody called Jan LeCun came up with something called a convolutional network a few years ago, and that's basically become the gold standard for image processing. So there's a few things that are different about convolutional neural networks. Firstly, the neurons are not arranged in these um, rows anymore. They're arranged in these kind of cuboid shapes, um, uh, cuboid shapes. Um, from left to right, we call these the channels, and each channel is basically detecting a feature in the image. And uh, the, each neuron in each channel shares its weights with all the other neurons in that channel. Um, that's important because if this neuron is detecting, let's say, an eye in a face detector algorithm, you want to be able to detect an eye anywhere in the image. So it applies the same weights at every location in the image. And it only connects each time to a small receptive field. So that means we're saving on our weight. So we're not having to connect to every single pixel in the image. We're just connecting to the small receptive field. And basically, you can consider it um, all of these neurons in channel one. You can consider them as, if you like, one neuron that's moving around the image. And I have an animation to show that. So um, just bear in mind that usually in convolutional networks, these cuboid blocks are used to imply the output after we apply the weights to the data. So rather than just the weights themselves. So this is a little animation. Here you see this 3 by 3 patch. That's our receptive field. And the little red numbers down here are the weights. And the other numbers are the input data. And um, what we're doing here is matrix convolution. And that's just, uh, if you don't know what it is, it's basically just multiplying 1 by 1 plus 1 by 0 plus 1 by 1 and so on all the way through. And if you continue through with that on this little yellow patch, you get 4 out. And all of the different neurons in this first channel, you can share the weights. So the weights basically just move across the image and spit out some output. And you can see that the output is uh, smaller than the input image, which could be problematic. But um, we'll come to that in a minute, uh, solutions for that in a minute. So basically, that's what convolution looks like in a sort of a two-dimensional example. And uh, it turns out if you have lots of layers, so I should mention also that this Bear in mind that this blue block is just the first hidden layer. So in these convolutional neural networks, you have lots of these blocks following on after each other for different layers. Um, and it turns out that the early layers in these convolutional images are learning very coarse features, like just edges, as you see here. And this is an example from a face detection uh, application. You see that sort of in the middle layers, they're learning more complex arrangements of uh, edges. So these edges kind of representing eyes and noses and mouths. And then later on, towards the very final layers in the image, they're learning to recognize actual whole faces. So it's kind of you're learning coarse features and learning how to put them together to make what it is you're trying to find. <coughs> um, a few bits of terminology, just things that come up in the tutorial or that might come up for you. Um, this little 3x3 three three yellow thing is sometimes called the patch or the filter or the kernel. So just be aware of the terminology. Um, 3x3, three 5x5, by 7x7, three, five by five, seven by seven, you see different sizes. 3x3 three three is pretty typical. You could do an even number, but it wouldn't be symmetrical, so people don't. 
Um, the stride is used to say how many steps across you're going to go or how many steps down you're going to go. So in our example, we just move our yellow box one step across and one step down in each step. And that's pretty typical, but you can have other strides. Um, padding is important. So um, when you write TensorFlow code or code in other um, libraries, you use this term padding is valid. And if you use valid padding, it means that your input, uh, which is shown in blue here, and your output are different sizes. So your output, as we said, will be smaller. If you use padding equals same, that means that you want your output from your convolution to be the same size as your input image. And all that the algorithm does for you there is it just pads the edges of your image with zeros. So depending on your filter size and your stride size, it just says how many zeros it needs to have. But in this case, just one layer of zeros. And then the output size turns out the same as the input size. And that's kind of desirable. If you, have, if you imagine that you're going to do lots of layers and you're shrinking your um, image size every time you go through the layers, you quickly deteriorate it away to nothing. So you don't really want to do that usually. Um, this uh, next tutorial, we're going to build a convolutional neural network, as I said. Um, it is a convolutional neural network, but towards the end, we also add some fully connected layers. And we have some other kinds of layers as well. So this is just a quick slide about network layer types. So the fully connected one we've seen already, that was um, the standard one that we had in our last tutorial. And the convolutional layer is the one I've talked about so far here. We also have something that's called a max pool layer. It doesn't matter too much if you follow this or you don't. If you're interested, <laughs> you can, but um, it's all coded in there for you, so you don't need to implement it or anything. So max pooling means that you, you go across your image and with a certain, um, again, kernel size and a certain stride size, you just take the maximum from each value. So in this case, we're looking at each quadrant of the input and we're just taking the maximum value to go out. So the maximum in this pink quadrant is six, the maximum in the green quadrant is eight. There's two reasons why you'd want to do max pooling. One is if you want to decrease your computational burden, so you're making your um, next layer smaller, basically. You could also do that with um, using valid padding, of course. Um, but the other more important reason to use max pooling is for some reason called regularization. So neural networks are really prone to overfitting. Overfitting means that your, um, your network is too closely coupled with the training data that you've given it. So it's a little bit obsessed with the fine detail of the training data that it has seen. And it doesn't generalize well to other test data, even if the test data looks quite similar to you or even if it's come from the same source. It might not generalize well if the network is overfitted. So by doing this, we're sort of um, smoothing things out, if you like, and not concentrating too much on the fine detail of these numbers, but sort of smoothing it out to a kind of a, you can also do an average pool layer, but in this case, we're doing a max pool. Um, we also have one other kind of layer in this uh, tutorial, which is called a dropout layer. Um, dropout is uh, something that we use in fully connected layers. And it basically means that during training, at random, uh, random you select random neurons and you just turn them off during some training steps. So in this case, for example, we've just turned off these two neurons. Um, the reason to do that is again for regularization. So for example, if you imagine that you're doing a face detection algorithm and this neuron is really focused on um, detecting eyes. And let's say that most of the faces it's seen so far can be defined very well by just detecting the eyes, then it can easily detect the whole face this neuron might become very strong, and the other ones around it don't have to work too hard, if you like. So by randomly removing neurons, it makes sure that all the other neurons have to work that bit harder. So the nose detector has to work hard, and the mouth detector has to work hard to make sure that if it now sees a picture of a person with sunglasses, it's not too reliant on being able to find the eyes to detect the face. So that's a kind of a high-level intuitive description of it. Um, it does have, obviously, mathematical background underneath, and it works pretty effectively in a lot of cases. Okay, so um, to finish up, I've just drawn the architecture of the network that we are going to run next. So this is, again, we're feeding in the MNIST data, these handwritten digits. They're stored as a one-dimensional layer, so we're actually going to have to resize them to their 28 by 28 image size. And 28 by 28 by 1, because it's a grayscale image, it doesn't have um, color channels, so it's just a one, uh, one is the third dimension. And for our next layer, we have 32 channels. So 32 is one of the parameters that you just pick out of your head. You decide, I'm going to detect 32 features in my, in my first uh, hidden layer. And uh, 5 by 5 is the filter size. So if you imagine this is the little patch that's moving around your input image, it's size 5 by 5. <coughs> and how we write this in the code is something like convolution 2D. You tell it the patch size. You tell it that the input depth is 1 and that the output depth should be 32. And we follow this up with a max pool layer, and that's actually what causes the input size to go from 28 to 
by 28 down to 14 by 14. Okay, and then we basically repeat the same thing again, except that this time we say we're going to have 64 channels in our next layer. And again, we follow that up with a max pool, which gets us down from 14 by 14 down to 7 by 7. Okay, so as we're going through this, we're basically kind of condensing the features of the image. And um, it turns out that if you've condensed the features of the image to a certain extent, then it does actually not too much harm to flatten it out, because at some point we do need to flatten this because our output has to be 10 by 1. So we do have to have a flattened array to work on at the end. So at this point, we flatten the data. So we go from 7 by 7 by 64 into a one-dimensional array of 1024. Um, we do a fully connected layer here, and we do a dropout layer here. And then finally, we do one last fully connected layer where we define the output size is going to be 10 by 1. And we have to define the output to be 10 by 1 because we want to have 10 classes coming out at the end. And then, of course, we put on our soft max as well because we want to have probabilistic outputs. So that's basically the diagram. I don't think it's even drawn on the TensorFlow website of the tutorial, so it's handy to look back on maybe if you want to. Um, and also at the end of this, I've just put some resources for deep learning for people who are interested in going back to this. The slides are all online. The links are in the, in the GitHub tutorial. Um, so there's some courses that are quite good. There's in the general, I mean, there's so many things, it's really difficult to pin down a few resources that are good here. There's absolutely masses of deep learning information on the web. For research information, Archive is really good. Everybody is putting deep learning re research there, so it's um, all open. And other, uh, there's Cheat Sheet for programming. And the last one is really good. I recommend you re should all do that because it's just fun stuff where you play with other people's neural networks and uh, it's quite cool. You don't have to do anything with coding. Okay, so that's it. Um, we go back to the tutorial. So uh, hopefully some people got through the additional exercises. Okay, so um, yeah, if your SSH sessions are still open, mine died, but if your SSH sessions are still open, you can go straight in and start um, with the MNIST deep Python file, which builds the network that we just looked at.